faces. Um, okay. Um, shoot, where'd it go? Ah, here we go. Great. All right. Uh, so what you're looking at, what you were looking at was a global magnetosphere model. So it's global because it's, um, there are some models that focus on different regions of the magnetosphere or, or only, uh, or zoom in. This is supposed to be covering the whole magnetosphere. Um, in fact, more, uh, I, I expect, I think in both cases, the visualization doesn't extend to the full model. So you didn't see all of the stuff going on down tail. Um, and maybe even not all of the stuff that's in front of the, uh, uh, the model to uh, allow for some room for the magnetosphere to breathe. So, um, so these global magnetosphere models, uh, Sorry, this I, I expanded this image and it cut off some of my uh, some of my nope. All right, we'll go with that. These global magnetosphere models, um, uh, prime, uh, they're MHD models, so they solve the MHD equations with the appropriate boundary conditions. There's an inner boundary condition and an outer boundary condition. Uh, the inner boundary condition is here at Earth. And that's where the Earth's magnetic field, uh, mo the model of the Earth's magnetic field, likely um, most, of, most often a shifted dipole. Uh, uh, sometimes the dipole, depending on how, how sophisticated you want to be, sometimes the dipole has a tilt relative to the uh, orientation. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's shifted, sometimes it doesn't, but you put whatever, um, uh, version of the Earth's dipole in there that you want to. Um, and then the outer boundary conditions um, are in the front here, and I'll talk about those for a minute. They're primarily the solar wind. Um, there's various, there's a number of different uh, competing models, if you, if you will. They, there's, some, there's some friendly competition among these, but they're also, um, I mean, this is part of science, right? So you, you have these different approaches to doing things. You try out the different approaches and you see which ones are, what the strengths and weaknesses of, of, of each of them are. Not, they all work to some extent and they all fail to some extent. So, um, so uh, some of the, 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 there's, I'm listing the three that I'm, I'm easily aware of. I'm sure there are more. Uh, the Lion Federer Mobari model, um, LFM, uh, then the Open GCM by so that obviously that's by uh, John Lyon is the the current uh, uh, owner uh, the current uh, 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 general well that he's the 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 most senior generation of that model and there's other people working on that uh, Open GCM GCM is Global Circulation Model. Beckett, that's, that's your working with that, right? Did I get that right? Where's Beckett? Oh, he's not here. Okay. I outed him, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, that's Jimmy Rader's uh, model at UNH. And then there's a Michigan model, uh, the uh, Space Weather Frameworks, also referred to as BATS R Us. Uh, and you can ask me about why it's referred to as BATS R Us later. Um, and it's not because it's black and block adaptive something, something, something grid. Um, but any, in any case, uh, there's the different, the primary difference between these models is there's various approaches to solving the MHD equations. So, uh, and well, so the, model that we're primarily going to be working with is the Space Weather Frameworks mo uh, model or the 
space weather modeling framework. Um, and it uses a block adaptive grid so that as um, the simulation runs and it sees that it more detail is needed in a particular area, say, oh, like at the bow shock where you're getting sharp uh, changes in the plasma parameters, um, it'll put more blocks in there and add more detail there. So you can see in this, this is one of the uh, uh, example images that they use. You can see as you're approaching the Earth's, uh, the inner boundary of Earth, it's putting more and more and finer and finer grid points in there to get finer and finer detail on the, um, on the uh, uh, simulation. Um, again, there's uh, various, the, each, each model picks its own approach to solving the differential equations, not just, and I say various differential equation solvers, not just the solvers themselves, but also how they um, implement the solvers and, and what, which version of the differential equations that they want to solve. Um, and then there are other assumptions and other things that they have to do. I know I'm most familiar with the, uh, the LFM model. I know one of the things that they have to do is they have to put a floor on the pressure. They were having trouble where they were getting negative pressures due to numerical um, um, issues. And so basically they just took Anytime they got a negative pressure, they put it, they set it to some minimum positive pressure. Um, and uh, so that's one of the, uh, the cheat little cheats and workarounds that you don't hear about until you are, you actually are working with the group and, and figure out what some of the details are. Boundary conditions. So I talked about the inner boundary condition as Earth's magnetic field. Um, the outer boundary condition um, is primarily at the front. Everything back, since the solar wind is supersonic, things uh, going out the back just keep going, and so it's absorbing boundary conditions out the back. The front, you're feeding in uh, the solar wind conditions that you want the, magne the magnetosphere to respond to. And we, we can look at some of those in some detail. So you could, and, and people often do, um, feed in uh, real solar wind conditions measured at L1 with a magnetic field, the um, density and the, the speed and et cetera, et cetera, all the plasma parameters that you need at, at, uh, uh, to drive the front end of this um, uh, simulation. Um, that is definitely used for forecasting, in fact, so now SWIPSI has a um, a magnetosphere model that is running in real time. So it's, it's feeding this in in real time. And uh, uh, as it gets a measurement for the uh, solar wind conditions, it updates the, the model. Um, the, and, I, I, and I say this is primarily for forecasting. People use this in research all the time as well. They'll, they'll feed in real, if they want to study a particular storm or they want to see how their model responds to a particular storm and compare it to say, GOES measurements or the magnetos, um, uh, uh, magnetometer measurements, um, they'll uh, uh, do that. Um, or the alternative is you can feed in artificial conditions. What, is, uh, what do you notice uh, uh, for the artificial conditions? Uh, anybody look at any of the artificial conditions from the uh, uh, the models that we were uh, looking at. Anybody, so I did, I gave you a link and asked you to look at that. I don't know if anybody looked at that. Anybody notice anything about the artificial conditions as compared to the real ones? Flat. Uh, they are more uh, constant. Yeah. Yeah, and real uh, are, um, in real, we have see some changes, uh, right. some, some fluctuations in signals. Yeah. And you know, some of those changes uh, certainly those the real the real ones have a lot of variation in the solar wind. The solar wind is fluctuating. You also have to be aware that some of those changes are also instrumentation, or they could be data dropout, 
right? So when you're feeding, one of the things you have to do when you're feeding these in, when you're feeding in real uh, um, uh, data, you should clean the data a little bit and figure out whether you like lost anything or, or there's, there's a problem. But yeah, so we're looking at um, artificial conditions. Anybody look at the B, the, the values of the magnetic field for some of these artificial conditions? Any, anything, anybody look at that carefully and, and strike you as odd? So here's instead of so instead of looking at the plot, I've just listed them for the uh, front in the list of the simulations that were um, available that you'll be looking at. Anybody notice anything about the uh, weird about the magnetic field components? Yeah, so BZ is going down actually. Uh, after some part, uh, the first part of BZ is constant, then it's going down. And similar for the case of BY, BY is first, it's constant, then it's going down, and right. then it's rising up kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, BY goes down? I have to check. Uh, so I, but this is the. A little bit, I think. Uh, but, but BZ goes down uh, yeah. much more. So here, here BZ, so I have to look at the. Uh, conditions that I gave you to look at. Okay, I'm thinking about these conditions here. Um, but yeah. So it's either, and it's, it's, all of them are either in the BX. So, well, there's no BX component. There's a B, there sometimes is a BY component and a BZ component. So, and which is, is very strange, right? You never have purely so BZ, you remember, is north and south. So it's BZ relative to the Earth's magnetic field. So this will be BZ southward. So Debesh, I think you sent me a, a message, yeah, earlier asking about what I mean by southward. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is negative. That means it's southward, which means that if the 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 northward magnetic field here in my picture, my, in my background here, is being uh, uh, banging up against the southward component of the solar wind that's coming in. So they're in opposite directions, right? Okay. Um, that is a completely and utterly artificial condition. When you're thinking about these, um, these models, it's a, it's, a, it's a good way to play with the model and, and get some feel for what's going on. Um, don't think about this as if it's real, right? And, and so keep in mind that it's just a, it's an idealized case. And the, the real cases do other things. Okay. Um, one more thing I want to get to before I cut you loose is that... Um, the magnetosphere models don't live in a vacuum. Um, they have to, so the, especially in the inner magnetosphere, there's three different populations of plasma that you have to account for. Um, one is the magnetosphere plasma itself. Another one is the ring current plasma. Um, and then there's the ionosphere plasma. And all these things have to be accounted for. Um, the 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 plasma sphere, the ring current is a, is also referred to as the is a, is modeled through a plasma sphere model. Um, that's not required, though. If it's not there, then any of the inner um, magnetosphere details are not going to be right. So that's something to keep in mind. That's something you want to ask when you're looking at magnetosphere models is do they have a plasma sphere model uh, embedded in it? Um, and then, but the ionosphere model is absolutely required. And the reason is, is that you've got these field aligned currents coming in from the uh, various current systems. I, and and that, that Amitabha mentioned yesterday, um, including the, the current sheet, but also then the, uh, the magnetopause current. And 
those current systems, they have to close someplace and they close in the ionosphere. Um, and that's what drives the, the activity at the polar ionosphere. Dana talked a lot about solar flares and driving the solar flares and the ionization, driving the, uh, the low latitude ionosphere and, and the, uh, the absorption on Chapman layers. Um, the, high, the high latitude ionosphere is driven primarily by these, well, it's driven by both, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's the, including this particle precipitation, these, these uh, field line currents is absolutely important um, for, and I always have to check when I look at these runs to remember what I did um, when, I, when, I, when I submitted them, but um, I use the simplest ionosphere possible, which is just there's a constant uh, conductivity, which is completely broken, Right, it's not true that con the connectivity isn't constant, but the um, but it works and it makes the model run. So, um, so it's a simple uh, model that that allows for um, uh, the model to run and you get some results out. All right. Um, questions on magnetosphere models. Okay. Uh, yeah, Milo, Milo, excuse me, yeah. I've been mispronouncing your, your name. Uh, it, it's all right. Uh, yeah, I wrote that question on the chat too, but yesterday when we were looking and comparing the model with the data, we also noticed that the temperature on the model, it's uh, about one order of magnitude higher than what you see in the data. Did you know if it is any reason for that? Uh, the, temp so the temperature, the temperature in the model, uh, the, what you see in the solar wind data. Yes. In, in, yeah, like even in in this, uh, well, not for this, but the plots that you showed us in the slides, when you compare the data, and yeah, it's like for yes, you can see that the temperature in the data is, is in the order of 10 to the 4 Kelvin, between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5. And then well, in the model is, is at least what we saw, it's uh, around 200,000 Kelvin. So it's, it's substantially higher. And we were wondering why. So, like twice, it could be twice as high or, or three or four times as high. Um, I don't, so I didn't pay that much attention to the temperature when I set up these runs in terms of the input. I took whatever default value was available. So, um, so and I don't know what the range of temperatures, I wasn't paying attention to the range of temperatures when yeah. I was, uh, so it's artificial. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, another question that I have is, uh, you mentioned that these models are not used only for forecasts, but also for research. Absolutely, uh, yeah. In that case, like if you are looking into a past event years ago, and you have real data, uh, what do you use for your boundary conditions? Is still this artificial boundary condition, or do you actually input the data? You put in, you put in, if you want to look at a real case, yeah, I mean, it's the, the thing that drives the model, the input to the model is the solar wind data, right? right? Okay. So if you're looking at a, a, a past event, you're gonna look at the solar wind data from the past event and, and put that in. Um, even if you have to reconstruct it somehow from other things that you might, you have to back it out somehow from other things that you might know. Um, so does that help? Yes, thank you, okay. thank you. Great. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I have one. I just want to share my screen just for once. Sure. Yeah. Oh, um, I think I can't share the screen. Oh, okay. since you are sharing, since, since you are sharing. <laughs> All right, I gotta stop sharing and I gotta figure out how to stop sharing. Oh boy. Oh. Hey, Kelvin, can you so, pull the screen back? Yeah, let me let me turn that off for you. Great, thanks. Yeah, I just want to mention that BY thing that I pointed that time. 
Okay. So here we can see that there is a drop in the BUL. Uh, BZ also drops here, it's higher and BY has a drop. All the other things are constant. Yeah, so in this, so yeah, right. So for this one, um, and so I'll explain what's going on here and then I'll explain what, you're look, what you were looking at in the results. So in this, in this first uh, portion here. Mm. Um, you mean here? Hang on. So this portion is north. This. Right. And okay. then this portion, so it's BZ is up. So X and Y are zero, BZ is up. Yeah, the second here. portion mm -hmm. is south. If you're annotating, we can't see it. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you see oh, it now? It yeah, I didn't hit return. So this portion is south. Mm -hmm. Right, so now BZ went from up to down. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then in this portion, it's west. The last row. Oh, last row, okay. yeah. So, because now BZ is pointing uh, from east to west across the earth, which is actually more realistic than purely north or purely south. So, typically, because of the Parker spiral, mm -hmm. the magnetic because the magnetic field is being is being rotated and and. Uh, as the solar wind comes out, BZ usually points like. You mean BY? Not easy. BY. BZ is zero. BX and BY are often in uh, uh, equal proportions at about 45 degrees. Is this GSE or GSM coordinates? Yeah, uh, G GSE. So a negative y component would be in the direction of Earth's orbit. It so I would say it's in the direction uh, per, um, opposite to the Earth's um, magnetic dipole. Uh, I'm not understanding the last part. Will you please repeat it again? That uh, why so the westward, is low. The B westward case. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. what So it's it's not low. It's going negative. Yeah, it's it's going negative. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it's it's still got a it's so all of the um, magnitudes of the magnetic field are the same, but this one um, cuts across from east to west. Uh, so the front in the front of the in this in the picture that I've got in my background, it would be coming in and out of the page, mm. probably into the page. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So here that is. So the open. flow is still coming in, but the magnetic field is going in and out of the page. Okay. So it's basically crossing the thing. Yeah. Across, going across. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, at this point, what I'll do is I'm going to send you, I want to send you off into your groups. Um, so fire up whichever version of the simulation was working for you um, and let's see how well that works. Um, if you're having trouble, we might have to switch to the other one depending on the, the bandwidth issues. Um, but uh, figure out, also figure out where you as a group, where you kind of left off and where you want to pick up on, on studying the lab. Certainly you should be looking at field lines um, you should see the various solar wind conditions. Um, so, uh, so uh, to finish off my uh, what Debesh was asking, the north. When I ask you about the north, the south, and the west case, those are uh, the three. Con the, those are the solar wind conditions in in all those cases. What you're looking at are snapshots from each of those those. Uh, um, uh, conditions. So you're just looking at a snapshot for that case and exploring what the geometry of the, of the uh, uh, magnetosphere is. All right. So
Any last questions before we send you off? Great, Kelvin, if you can open up those groups and, uh, and I'll be roaming around and I think uh, Dolores may be roaming around as well so we can answer questions about uh, what you're seeing and what's, how things are working. Okay, sounds good, Nick, uh, opening up the groups now. Great, thank you. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, so I think we're all back. Um, I just wanted to enforce a, uh, a five minute break. So um, if we get uh, take a short take a short break, stretch your legs, get get uh, whatever you need, and when we come back, I'll give you uh, a little more instruction about how to proceed for the next uh, half an hour or so, and um, and uh, and and then we'll move on. Dolores, may I ask you a question? Sure, Liz. Hi, uh, so I, it's the thing I was, I actually kind of would like to ask you during your office hours with, I don't know, in two days, because um, it's not, but it's, it's not really summer school related, but it's space weather publishing related, if that's uh -huh. all right. Uh -huh. um, so I'm currently doing, um, a survey study with SWPSI asking the researchers about um, the resources they have, how effective they are, and, and what their priorities for improvement are to kind of um, communicate like a wish list, a prioritized wish list to the research community mm -hmm. and things along those lines. And my advisor and I are having the hardest time trying to find the most reasonable place to publish it. Oh, I know uh, a place. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, wait, yeah, because. The target audience kind of was just like anyone, like research community wise, not so much the R2O community, if that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, I don't know, if you have any suggestions, that would be fantastic. Um, actually, that's that when I was the uh, editor in chief for Space Weather, which I'm, I'm still carrying, carrying around the editor uh, badge with me. Uh, those are exactly the kinds of articles that, that the journal was intending to publish to try and do that communication across um, oh, okay. the sub, not 
not, I don't want to say across disciplines, but across the subdisciplines of space weather or to try and bring the different communities together. So uh, when, when I redid the, uh, you know, the kind of the journal vision statement, that, that kind of thing was very much in my mind. Okay, so it's for the Space Weather Journal by AGU, not Space Weather Quarterly or anything like that? Uh, yeah, Space Weather Quarterly is now go gone. It's become essentially an online digest. AGU decided that they wanted to kill the print publications that went with that. So it, huh. the quarterly is just, a, is just kind of highlighting things that have, have um, already been done. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, I, I would, I would uh, strongly, uh, strongly recommend uh, reaching out to uh, uh, Noe Loges, who's the new uh, uh, editor. I think he'd be very interested in that work. Okay. You can you feel free to drop names. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and he's the current editor, right? He's the current editor in chief. I'm I'm still an editor. Uh, slowly working my way uh, out um, but okay. that's, I'm just off doing other things but yeah absolutely that sounds like a great topic yeah everyone I've talked to has been very excited about it yeah I just wasn't entirely sure if the audience would be the audience that I was trying to reach so okay thank you very much that's very helpful I, I, I absolutely think that's uh, on target okay cool thank you all right, if you're back, uh, turn on your camera so I know. Okay, not everybody's back yet. Kendra's back. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Nick, I'm going off for a refill on coffee. I'll be back. Okay, great. All right. Um, so the uh, so I think you you all kind of tried to get caught up and and uh, shared some of you shared what you were doing. Some of you caught up on uh, on a couple of things, and and some of you went on to other things. Um, I'm not going to give you too much direction right now. What I'd like you to do is continue working in, in your groups, um, if, you're, if you found something that you were exploring, uh, for, you know, for example, one, one group was exploring the Northward case and looking for reconnection there. If you, if you're, if you wanna continue doing that, that's great. If you, uh, one group was looking for uh, plasma sheet, evidence of plasma sheets in the tail, that's great. Um, if you, so if you're exploring something, if you were interrupted exploring something, continue doing that. If you are looking for something to do, pick one of the tasks in part two. And, um, and, uh, and, um, uh, and choose that and work on that for a while. You can pick, I'm not going to, I'm not going to direct you to pick any particular task. Um, I'm going to give you about uh, 25 more minutes, maybe 20 more minutes in here, and then we can have a readout at the end to see what people explored. Uh, and Dolores and I and Dana will be around. Dolores tells me that she's already gotten one new slide for her talk later this afternoon, so uh, or, or later, and so uh, from. Uh, sorry, one new slide from one of the groups. So uh, right. absolutely. Uh, yeah, so you guys are, are apparently doing some interesting exploration. So, um, so uh, we'll have uh, Kelvin send you back off, and we'll be around. And you got about twenty minutes or so to to explore something different. Okay, Nick. Opening up the uh, breakout rooms now. Devesh, um, sorry to hear about your internet issues. Uh, let me send you over to room one. Yes, yeah, please. All righty.
Seta, are you able to hear me? Let's just have a true uh, discussion. We'll see where it goes. And, you know, um, I hope by the end we get to why the sea mines blew up, but we'll okay. make a great run at it. And are you going to want to use any of the breakout rooms for, uh, for discussion? I think not. I think that okay. I, I think I'll just kind of call on a group here and there and 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 see what is uh, you know what 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 we're hearing. Okay, great. I just wanted to give Kelvin a heads up about that. Great. Yeah, I, I think we'll try and keep it real simple. Okay, great. Okay, I think we're mostly back. Uh, turn your screens on if you're back. Okay, so um, so I'm going to hand it over to Dolores, um, who as has already been uh, implied as a long um, history in um, in space weather and uh, space physics, and and among other things, has <coughs> has a very nice textbook out, uh, understanding space weather, understanding the physics of space weather. So and hmm. I, I was just going to say I I'm ho I just got a couple of uh, small grants to uh, start turning this into uh, case studies that will go yeah. with this book. Great, and then uh, also was editor in, was editor in, editor editor in chief <laughs> for, for the AGU Space Weather publication, um, and has uh, is is trying to. Uh, extract herself from that at this point in time because uh, it's a lot of work and um, uh, and we can uh, hear a little bit more about her career um, at some point uh, maybe even during this talk yeah uh, probably right at the beginning of the second uh, part I'll say a little bit more about that great all right well uh, Nick asked me to uh, to give kind of my view of uh, geomagnetic storms and what it takes to to make one so I decided to title this classical views and developing views and the developing views part is code for what we don't know but we wish we knew and you know how bad can it get so that's the developing views part which will go into the second uh, second hour so I, I chose this uh, graphic because uh, we've talked um, yesterday about a lot of the uh, aspects of this and it continued in through the lab uh, work this morning, um, recognizing that we've got a, a kind of our own cell of uh, magnetized volume that a lot of things are going on in it, which can be basically considered system science. So we'll, uh, we'll just dig in and see if we can make a, uh, uh, kind of a coherent discussion of this. And I'll tell you right up front what parts I'm leaving in and what parts I'm leaving out, but I've got some material that is um, at the end of the presentation. It's, I didn't quite get it uploaded. If we need to go reference that, that's what we'll do. Okay, so I thought we should probably come up with some definitions and motivation for why we would uh, include a talk like this in the heliophysics summer school because it very definitely says geomagnetic, but storms. But um, quite frankly, this is our geosphere is the best observed system, so it makes a lot of sense to figure out what we have in our, uh, in our own backyard. So we'll talk just a little bit about places and spaces and um, physical effects as the list of physical effects has grown over the years. And then I definitely wanna spend a little bit time on indices because I ask you to do that for uh, you know, a, a pre-lesson uh, activity. And then we'll, we'll dig into the geomagnetic storms and their, you know, what are all the processes going on. The second part of the talk or the third part of the talk here, the historical event will be um, the second lecture that I, I do after we take a break. So I created my own uh, variation or definition of geomagnetic storm. It's a multi-day, uh, sometimes just multi-hour disturbance in our magnetized volume that uh, is associated with enhanced energy dissipation. Uh, and it typically involves a very strong magnetospheric convection 
and something called bursty flows or bursty bulk flows, which is a, a, a behavior that it was discovered in the last 20 years, and it's going to be illustrated in the movie that we that I put up uh, a little bit earlier. So these, this idea of a geomagnetic storm uh, fits kind of squarely in the middle of heliospheric disturbances. So either inter, uh, planetary coronal mass ejections are a possible driver. Um, large scale solar wind structures like coronal hulls will give also uh, geomagnetic storms, but typically milder ones. Uh, they just don't have the long intervals of persistent southward IMF, but they have very high solar wind speed. So that's another aspect of it. So uh, there are all kinds of uh, geospheric storms, geomagnetic storms being one of them. And then there's kind of a sub element of that called substorm. We'll talk about that because substorms definitely have a role in, in creating what's called a geomagnetic storm. The things that I actually personally research are a little more along the lines of ionospheric storms and thermospheric storms. I didn't put that in as a main topic of this presentation, but uh, for the second hour, you're going to see some of the effects of those types of storms um, when, they, when they actually are able, uh, those systems are able to extract energy from the geomagnetic storm. Now, the reason that we would do this is uh, certainly because uh, we want to understand what might be the impacts of these types of storms on humans and engineered systems and even on our atmosphere. And uh, I think as you'll see, this is a great opportunity to uh, study uh, system science in, in all of its glory because all of these things are driving and interacting and, and back driving um, as, as the storms develop. So the places and spaces, a really classic overview. I, th I think this was originally published in um, Russell and uh, Kibbleson and Russell in 1995, but probably this diagram has a history before that, but I just wanted to point out to you that we're going to try and have some discussions um, about anything that's in color here. So uh, the I'll, I'll spend most of my time talking about particle behavior, but that particle behavior is being driven by day side and night side reconnection. So those are topics that um, both uh, Dana and Amitava have, uh, have brought up. So those are our energy sources for driving uh, currents uh, or particle populations. I'm not going to say so much about the currents uh, in the sequence that I have, but I do have backup slides if we want to, to uh, talk about those. And I will also point out that everything that seems to be a particle population shown here kind of in kind of aqua color um, has a, a different colors. So if it's aqua color, it means typically that the particles are a little bit more energetic. Uh, this blue region here is a region of colder particles that have been extracted from Earth's atmosphere. One of the really interesting characteristics of a geomagnetic storm that has only recently started getting a lot of discussion is how do we extract the particles from this region, get them all the way back into the tail, energize them, and then bring them back into the ring current where it can then interact with the cold particles again. So quite a circulation system. I took uh, this physical effects uh, list from uh, at least a start from um, a paper that was in uh, JGR, uh, Journal of Geophysical Research in 2003. Anything that's in blue here was listed as a physical effect of a geomagnetic storm in 2003. And now I'm adding things that are in black and we'll have just very short, maybe one slide uh, discussion of the things that are in black. But the things that are in black are now very active areas of, uh, of research. So the primary thing that is associated with a geomagnetic storm that's easy to measure are these magnetic disturbances at Earth's surface. 
And the history of that goes all the way back over 200 years to von Humboldt, who started putting out the first magnetometers. And as soon as the first magnetometers got deployed on Earth's surface, we noticed that there were disturbances. And so Humboldt was actually going, huh, there is something going on here. As that system has developed, it's allowed for thresholding and uh, essentially kind of measurements, if you will, from a on the ground, but on the ground is a remote uh, sensing method if you've got the currents and the particle flows in space. So we've got a ground-based system that is actually a remote measuring uh, de a device or set of devices. So let's go on with that and look at what has become the classic view of a geomagnetic storm. And it is associated with a variation or a reduction in Earth's low latitude surface field that's measured as something called the disturbance storm time index. That terminology came out of uh, magnetometer studies that were done in the late 1950s and early 1960s, kind of the post uh, international geophysical year, when we actually had magnetometers posted all over the world. And this is an example of a month-long variation of the low latitude magnetic field with the background field removed. And you can see that it has a scale of nanotesla over here and then 30 days in the month of June. And there's a kind of a small disturbance here and then another much larger disturbance here which um, um, falls into a zone that would be called an intense storm. Um, you see two colors here. We have actually gotten pretty good at making a similar measurement in space. And uh, this company called Atmospheric and Environmental Research uh, is uh, contracted to the US Air Force to show that they can do, essentially make the same measurements from space that can be measured from the ground worldwide. And there's some advantages to being able to look um, from above and below. Now, this surface magnetic uh, depression is caused by a band of energized ions that are encircling Earth in a, in a behavior that's called a ring current. Most of that energy is being carried by medium energy ions, so let's call it 50 keV ions. Um, the electrons have a minor role uh, because they tend to be scattered out of the uh, configuration uh, by wave particle interactions. I'll just say that I love and hate the DST index because it is used and misused and abused in so many ways, but because we need a common way to talk about storms, this is what we have. Uh, there are other current systems than the ring current that are contributing to the DST index, and that's been shown in the literature over and over again. Now, I think one of the first things that I ask you to do in an activity is to come up with a uh, look at the, the uh, signal from the um, uh, jigsaw puzzle storm and identify what were the initial phase, main phase, and recovery phase. So let's see if I can, oh, before we do that, let me just point out to you that there's a lot of uh, back and forth in the literature about how to categorize storms. The one thing that is generally agreed upon is if the DST index or the Earth's magnetic field is depressed by more than 100 nanotesla, we're going to call that an intense storm. The number for changing over from quiet to moderate, now it seems kind of flexible. I put it at 50. Putting uh, the boundary on what is a, a, sup a super storm or extreme storm, yeah, that's somewhere in the 250 nanotesla range, and it appears to depend on who's writing about things. Uh, Jeff, you have a question. Uh, yes, and if this should be held until after the activity, just let me know. But um, I know in this in this uh, instance, we had two storms, and so the question came up in my time zone group. We see the initial perturbation is what you're referring to as a strong or an intense storm. But then the second storm does not seem to depress that same by that same amount. And I'm curious if you have multiple storms, if it can actually 
alter that value of the DST by the same magnitude or if it gets more and more difficult to push it stronger? Well, that is a great question. and We actually don't have a definitive answer uh, to that. We do know that there are times when there are multiple drivers. There might be a coronal mass ejection being followed by a high-speed stream or a high-speed stream maybe approaching Earth, I think is what we found in the uh, uh, situation with the uh, July 2017 storm. And then you've got a, C, a CME kind of sneaking up in the background, followed by another high-speed stream. And that is the real um, task for forecasting what kinds of reactions we're going to get in geospace as a result of these interacting um, drivers. Uh, so that is, that is why we develop these kinds of models that you've been looking at so that we can drive them with, with a various um, uh, uh, just, just various temporal changes and, and see what we get. So it's a great question to which there is no real answer. Has that not been seen in any like uh, running data of, of multiple events occurring? Oh yeah, it has. It's just that if you see one storm, you see one storm. So there is a, there, there are a lot of work on what's called superposed epoch analysis, where you try and say, okay, we'll, we'll stack up all the storms and we'll start the storm uh, all of these storms, we'll look at them just as say this initial phase starts. And then what is the general characteristic that develops from that? But as soon as you get another kind of perturbation like this one here, you go, hmm, what was, you know, it didn't enter and hit a pristine system. It, it actually interacted with a system that's already disturbed. Okay, thank you. Well, Lewis, there's another yes. question from Krishna. Uh, yes. on the chat, which is how is the magnetometer data from different locations combined? Ah, uh, that, uh, that is group work that are work that is done by these world data centers. Uh, in this case, uh, the world data center at Kyoto is the, is the designated center for taking the measurements in this case from four generally spaced and equally spaced in longitude uh, measurements and then removing the baseline, which is a, a kind of an arduous task from each magnetometer, you know, reflecting the fact that we might be in different seasons or different part of the solar cycle. So getting that quiet day baseline that you can remove is a significant effort. And many times you will see that these indices are not in their final form for 18 to 24 months after the data have been taken. So it's, it's quite the effort, but there's, there are designated data centers whose job it is to do that. Is that, Krishna, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank yes. you. Yes, okay. yes, yes, so thank you, Dolores. Uh -huh. All right, so activity one, I asked if you would identify a storm phase. So I'm just going to call out uh, group five. Oh. Well, now I, I put the answer up here. <laughs> I have a little problem getting the sequence up. So uh, maybe I don't have, I think everybody probably did this, so I don't have to call out group five in particular. But uh, this is your, this is the, DST index from the jigsaw puzzle storm. And our initial phase is right here. But the characteristic of that initial phase is very often that we get an increase rather than a decrease in DST. Um, feel free to unmute. Who can tell me what they think that uh, increase is associated with? Any ideas? Do you mean the small section right before the large spike? Yes, so that first, uh, well, that large spike actually is what I'm interested in. The shock. Yeah, could that be the compression of the magnetosphere? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Interplanetary shock. It's an interplanetary shock. And if we were to go back here, what we will see is that is the signal at Earth 
of this Chapman Ferraro current and other currents inside the magnetosphere being excited as the shock hits. So that uh, shock hitting is usually a good indication that whatever is following in the solar wind is going to be coming at the earth pretty fast because you don't get shocks without, uh, without solar wind speed increases. So that's already a, you know, kind of a warning that, hey, hey, something's coming along here. Then <clears throat> a precipitous drop, which is an indication that those ions that I've already mentioned are um, getting organized, and we'll talk about how that happens. Uh, and they are going to be circulating around the Earth. And then this very long recovery phase where those ions are either leaving the ring current or they're recombining with other particles uh, or charge exchanging, but that's a very slow decay process. So once we get these particles quasi-trapped around Earth, they tend to hang around for, for several days. So uh, let's see, we've got um, something a little bit different here. Uh, Stefan. Yeah, the question for the main phase, why is the end of the main phase at this first peak and not the second? There's a second deeper uh, about minus 60, like yeah, it, a day later. Why is it not until there from a sm smooth recovery phase? I would, which I would more expect a gr more gradual recovery. Yeah, so typically the definition is it, the main phase is what uh, the point at which you get to the most depressed state for the surface magnetic field. But as you, as you point out, there's lots of other little depressions coming along in here, some of them sharper, and then they, t they look like they spread out a little bit less sharp. And those are what we call substorm injections. So there's still energy being put into the system. Uh, it's, it's just that a lot of the energy that was put in has, uh, uh, is starting to leak out. And now you're in a phase where you're, you're looking at, okay, energy in versus energy out. Thanks. Okay. I'll just, uh, I'll just bring this up and say, the DST index is an hourly index, but very often you'd re, you know, magnetometers are making high resolution measurements. So there's a, another index, which is just the one minute version of the hourly index, and it's called SIMH for symmetric field in the horizontal component. And you can see that it has even uh, more detail and the shock uh, response here in this particular event for your jigsaw puzzle, the increase in the magnetic field is almost as large as, as the depression. So that's a pretty good indication that you've had quite a solar wind uh, pressure uh, variation. But otherwise, it looks about the same. It's higher resolution and the information is derived from six stations rather than four. Okay, now, so I ended up answering all the questions I was going to uh, ask of you, which is not the way I'm supposed to do it, but let's see if I can get better as we go along. So I, I, I do want to now just introduce this classic 2D schematic. Uh, I did find one that's approximately scaled from Parks in 2015. And I'm, we're going to go through and look at mostly the particles behavior that is going on in, within this magnetized volume. So we've got a magnetic cell here that excludes. So I'm sorry to interrupt before you go on. Um, uh -huh. So there's a question in chat in, uh, is SIMH, is horizontal field is basically BZ? Uh, the, it, it is uh, aligned with BZ. So at the equator, Earth's magnetic field is northward pointing if it were a dipole. And so it would align with the vertical axis. So yes, you could call it the vertical B 
BZ, but when we, in order to keep ourselves uh, sorted out from the IMF BZ component in the solar wind, we tend to just refer to it as the horizontal component at the Earth magnetic at Earth surface. Okay, great. Does that is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm just about to put on headphones because of all the times that we could have work done on the roof of our house. This is it. And you don't need to hear my roof of my house coming off. Okay, um, so we've got this magnetic cell that mostly excludes the solar wind, but I think Amitava told you yesterday that it's about 90% effective, so maybe about 10% of the solar wind plasma gets in. Uh, it is surrounded by shocked solar wind that has gone through the bow shock, which is slowing down the incoming uh, flow to subsonic. As a result, uh, the system is compressed on the day side and deformed, stretched out under southward IMF conditions to several hundred RE. I'm not going to say too much about this bounding current sheet. Something had to go to keep within time, so I won't say too much, but we can talk about it in office hours. Um, if the incoming magnetic flux in the solar wind is completely frozen into the solar wind, then there wouldn't be any mixing, there wouldn't be any reconnection, and the system would be closed. But in order to get a geomagnetic storm, we need it to be otherwise. So we need to be thinking about this uh, possibility of reconnection on the day side that Amitabha and others have talked about. So that's this pink region right here that is uh, associated with the subsolar point for southward IMF. As we get to some of the pictures from the, the groups, we'll find out that for northward IMF, the reconnection points uh, move up to the high latitude regions. What this solar wind is doing is, compared to a stationary observer at Earth, this magnetized, highly conducting solar wind is bringing to a stationary observer an imposed electric field whose direction is minus V cross B. And, and in, that's considered the solar wind electric field. But when the fields in the solar wind link to Earth's magnetic fields, then we often switch to calling that the convection electric field. So the convection electric field, the motion of plasma, um, becomes enhanced by southward IMF and by fast solar wind flow. It turns out that that is the primary set of drivers for geomagnetic storms. All of the particle populations inside the magnetosphere will become excited or perturbed in some way during a geomagnetic storm. Some of those uh, perturbations are just now being uh, explored. Uh, we know that this plasma becomes subject to these convection electric fields, so plasma start to drift, and if we pile up the plasma, then it will organize into currents as well. So let's see, um, I did ask for solar wind conditions and looking at other indices. Um, let me just, I'll randomly call before I reveal the answer. How about if I go to, to uh, synchronous group two? What did you find out about the other indices, say the AP or the KP? Uh, how did they line up with the DST index? Can I get a, a rep from, so, from Synchronous Group 2 to say something about that? Was that one of the other activities? It's, it's Activity 3. Oh, so I, um, I broke them down by groups. Ah, oh, right. So which group worked on Activity 3? Um, time Zone 2 group did work on it. OK. Jeff, what did you Wait. find out? I'm trying to pull that up right now. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, it's that during the storm, uh, during the actual storm itself, they seem to align 
relatively well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that all of the indices except for DST seem to uh, return back to their quiescent time uh, rather quickly, whereas DST took a lot longer to recover fully. Right, right. Uh, and let me just flip forward to that. So that, that is, in fact, the result. So the DST has a very long uh, recovery time, and that's associated with the magnetosphere figuring out what to do with all those particles that it has piled up in the region uh, in three to eight RE around Earth. They can't just disappear. They're, they're so uh, tenuous that there's not the ability for them to uh, interact and recombine, uh, and they're quasi-trapped, so they're kind of stuck on those field lines. So th the DST is a slow um, return to baseline index. Whereas all of the other indices that you see, like the KP and the AE and the polar cap index, KP is a subauroral uh, index. Uh, AP is the linearized version of that. The AE index is an auroral zone index, and the polar cap index is from one magnetometer station in the North Pole or sometimes from the South Pole. All of those respond to the very strong driving at the beginning of the storm and maybe at the recovery phase, but they will tend to return to baseline um, much quicker than the DST index because those currents that are driving those systems die away a lot quicker. So yeah, that's, that's exactly what happens. I'm just gonna uh, quickly go back and take a look at that, uh, what, what kinds of drivers there might have been in the solar wind that's associated with this uh, DST index, and you can see here, uh, I picked out the solar wind, the total magnetic field. So just as, as that storm initial phase started, we saw a huge spike in uh, the total field, and that was uh, largely driven by the IMFBY, the field component in the solar wind that's in the ecliptic but followed almost immediately by a huge southward turning. And then the other thing that happened is the solar wind speed went, uh, started rising very quickly. What I did not put on here, but some of you may have noticed what the, was that there was also quite a large density spike. So the shock had in advance of it or at its leading edge, quite a pileup of uh, material that um, uh, sometimes has its own in interesting way of, of seeping into the system and providing um, particles for these various current systems. Jeff? Uh, yeah, two things. One, I think there might be a question in the chat as well, but uh, just quickly, the, the solar wind speed mm -hmm. that you have plotted here, where is that measured at? That is measured uh, up at the L1 monitor. So, okay. uh, yeah, so it will be typically an hour ahead of Earth. Right, so that's uh, kind of why I'm curious about it because here it almost looks as though they're starting at the same time as oh, the- he, Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. The data from the OmniWeb database, all of the measurements have been adjusted to appear as if they are at the Earth's bow shock. So there does appear to be more simultaneity based on the way that the system has been, um, the data have been processed. And the other thing is we're using the real DST index. So it's an hour average of the four values. And so you're, you're getting a little bit of an average behavior uh, from the DST itself. Sure, okay, thank you. And the question in chat was about the, um whether there were real-time, high cadence real-time indices reported. So I, I responded with KP, but that, that apparently wasn't satisfactory enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's just go back up. Uh, oh, no, uh, go forward here. So the KP index is almost, uh, the official KP index is, has a three hour resolution. Space Weather Prediction Center uh, is watching these things in real line and typically uses uh, kind of, they can, they can look at it in one hour or they can look at it as a kind of a three hour sliding window. I've used the official version here. The uh, AE index is something that can be commute, computed on a uh, one minute basis. 
And the polar cap index is typically on a 15 minute cadence. So that, so it's kind of interesting when you're doing a research, you do have to be aware of the different cadence of the indices and trying, if you're trying to correlate those. Okay, well, uh, thanks for all these great questions and we'll just uh, continue on. Oh, um, oh, I know, I also asked, um, Related to the number of intense storms, how often would we find an event that would be uh, more negative than one than uh, 100? So here's kind of the entire uh, distribution of plots from Omni of uh, the data from OmniWeb, and you see most of the time it's pretty quiet. DST is minus 20 or maybe minus. 30 or 40, but then if you go and blow up this region here, I, I ask the question, how often, what fraction of this distribution is this? And um, it's really tiny, a really tiny fraction. It's less than 1% of the time we have a DST index more negative than minus 100. So when we're looking at these intense storms, they're the ones that get our research attention, but they're actually kind of a small fraction of the actual inventory of things going on in the magnetosphere. Uh, okay, so let's take a quick look at the basics of the uh, magnetosphere topology. I wanna look first at the plasma sphere here and just mention that that's a, a population of particles that have been drawn out of Earth's ionosphere. They're considered cold on the order of one electron volt. And because they're so cold, they're pretty much tied to the magnetic field lines. So they co-rotate with Earth. This inner magnetosphere magnetic field is turning with Earth. And those particles are obliged to go with the magnetic fields. So it's called a co-rotating plasma. It provides uh, a lot of the inertia, if you will, in the inner magnetosphere. And then um, the radiation belts, kind of the, the unruly children of the uh, particle population. These are these hot, meaning MeV level particles. Uh, the outer belt, which is somewhere between four and eight Re, the energy density is associated with the high energy electrons. If we go into the inner belt, uh, the energy density is associated with the high energy ions. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about the outer electron belt and the inner ion belt. And just be aware that what they're really saying is they're describing the population that's carrying the energy. You really don't have a, that kind of a charge separation with electrons on the outside and ions on the inside. Otherwise, you would build up one devil of an electric field, which the system just would not permit to, to exist. Is that just to say that one species tends to dominate in that region versus the other? Well, there have to be the same density of charge particles positive and negative at any location in space. Otherwise, the plasma will go running around trying to, to fix that charge separation problem. It's just that in this outer zone, the particles that have the most energy are the electrons, but there's a bunch of coal ions running around in there somewhere so that you could at least have charge uh, equilibrium. And inside here, you have the, uh, ions having the most of the of the energy so it's really who's got the energy density that get, gets described as which one of these is the ion belt and which one is the electron belt gwen um can you maybe explain why you get these like layers uh, happening in the ion so you have these really cold co-rotating ions in the plasma sphere and then above that you have really high energy ions mm -hmm. and then later you have not high energy ions again <laughs> why does that happen all of these all of these populations coexist in time and space okay and we just have detectors that go out and say oh let me make a measurement in this energy band 
or maybe we're making the detection uh, as these particles precipitate into the ionosphere to create the aurora. And so we sort them uh, based on their energies and to some degree based on the field lines that they have been attached to and which they may get kicked out of to precipitate into the atmosphere. But that is, that is one of the ideas that is just so confusing to students who are starting out in this, and especially to students who do more of their heliospheric work and, and don't live much in the, uh, in the inner magnetosphere, that there's all of these populations that coexist. And they, they kind of do their best to stay out of each other's way because the densities really are low. But during storm time, the separations between these charged particle populations just comes unglued. And that's what makes for great storm dynamics. So that's a kind of a hand wavy uh, answer, that, but hopefully, uh, hopefully that's helpful to, to start. So does it have something to do with the loss cones? So which it, particles are in the loss cone and which are not? Or? Yeah, so if they're not in the loss cone, they're as designated here. But if they get into the loss cone, so if they get some energy by whatever means, and it might be wave particle interaction during storm time, they can get kicked out of that loss cone. They'll get enough energy to exceed their mirror point and drop into the atmosphere. And so those particles that do that are lost to the particle distribution and hence the name loss cone. Dolores, can I add two comments to that, or do you want sure. to go? Yeah, no, go, go ahead. We'll get to where we get to. And okay. <laughs> yeah, if we have to do something office hours or discuss things else, we'll just so do it. One of, yeah, so one of the, the other things to emphasize about the radiation belts is they're very, very low density populations. Thank you, yes. And so they don't they're along for the ride in the magnetosphere. They don't mm -hmm. affect the magnetosphere, the structure of the magnetosphere. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely right. And then for the outer magnetosphere, if you do the, the back of the envelope calculation for the gyro radius for mm -hmm. um, the ions, high energy ions there, you're gonna find out that the gyro radius is so big that they just fly off. They don't, they're not trapped. You're right, thank you. Yeah, lots of things that I would love to have long discussions on, but I just can't, can't quite get there. But thank you for that comment about the radiation belts, because when we're thinking about all these modules that we need to put into these simulations, uh, the radiation belts generally are handled by a, a group of people that can kind of pull it in or pull it out. The, the, the feedback to the rest of the magnetosphere from the radiation belts is occasional, let's say. Now there's somebody who's a radiation belt aficionado who will probably just roll over on that, but, but let's just say for right now that the priorities have not gone into including radiation belts because they're not really a plasma. They are single particles doing their own thing. And that's a little harder to capture in, in these uh, simulations. All right, we'll move on. So now uh, here's, here's the plasma sheet. Here's the thing that is going to extract particles from any place it can find. Uh, it can be replenished by the solar wind. It has a storm time contribution from the ionosphere. And then this plasma sheet is what's going to feed the aurora. It provides particles to be energized for the radiation belt and for the ring current itself, which is what I'm putting in here now in this lovely green color with a little arrow to indicate that, oh yeah, we're extending some of these particles. It's plasma sheet particles by and large that are the uh, extension uh, closer to earth of what has been a plasma sheet. These are cool to medium particles and they are highly variable. And it is this ring current that when you build enough of these particles in this 50 keV range, get them quasi trapped 
at three to eight Earth radii, they have enough density and enough energy that they will actually create a magnetic field that can be sensed at the surface of the Earth that is opposed to Earth's magnetic uh, surface northward field. That's where the depression in the DST index comes from. So um, one of the things that is really confusing is this idea that there are substorms and that substorms have a very interesting interaction with storms, but it's not a one for one. If you just get a bunch of substorms, do you necessarily get a geomagnetic storm? And the answer is no. But substorms are a key element of geomagnetic storms. So what I'm showing you here is a color diagram, um, and I can't remember which volume of the textbook that it comes out of, but it's uh, created by Fran Baganel. And she's illustrating here the Dungy substorm cycle, which is this open up on the day side with southward IMF with the plasma and the particles, uh, rate, uh, essentially pull these magnetic field lines back into the tail where they will pile up and then this hard to describe series of events that involves reconnection and substorm production happens. So we're looking at it from the day side, uh, or looking at it from noon midnight, and here we're looking at it from above the equatorial plane. So somewhere out here around 20 RE, all that's highly variable, is where you actually have these oppositely directed magnetic field lines able to come together for reconnection. And when they do that, uh, which they are doing under E cross B drift, um, they will reconnect and form streamlines of uh, plasma that's both cool and hot. I'm just showing the streamlines for the cool plasma here. That means that plasma is following along with the dipolarized field lines heading back to Earth. And this is this Dungy cycle, as it's called, it's rarely steady state. It's characterized, as Amitava mentioned, by magnetic instability. Uh, and there are some particles and channels that gain much more energy than this, which we'll come to in just a minute to look at the movie. But I thought I saw Andreas's hand go up. Yeah, so one question more about the ring curve. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have a coronal mass ejection passing over the Earth with a strong southward BZ. Mm -hmm. So, the magnetic field that we measure on the ground is only due to the ring current of the injected particles, which forms as a consequence of that, or? Oh, tough no, question. The, the if, you, if you want to get into a good bar fight, you just raise that question to uh, folks who study the, the ring current and the other currents in the system. I will tell uh, my personal opinion, and I have not done all of the calculations to tease it apart, but during the really active times of a, uh, uh, the beginning of a, a geomagnetic storm, there is undoubtedly contributions to the DST, uh, from, to the DST index from currents other than the ring current. And there are papers written on that. I can't quote any of them, but I, I would be happy to, to, to help you uh, look those up if you're so inclined. But I can tell you the DST index is often misused as being completely and only representative of the ring current, and that's just wrong. My first firm statement for the day. <laughs> Dolores, we're coming up to a break time, so when you oh when my you gosh break break point, that would be great. Uh, so have I been at this for forty minutes already? Something like that, yes. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, uh, let's just get to let's go two more so that we can take a look at the at the movie. So this is the uh, this is the um, substorm plasmoid cycle from um, from the textbook. Uh, I wanted you to know that this. This is the far end, the tail end. If you look at the behavior of the particles, then uh, energized and disturbed and putting, going into the lost cone, you'll see these <laughs> beautiful auroral structures that go from 
uh, left to the right and then down. And this is essentially the version of what's called an auroral substorm. So uh, this will be our breaking point <clears throat> right after we look at this video. I've had you look at it before. This is from Mike Wiltberger and he is um, uh, basically uh, using an MHD model. We're looking down from the North Pole. You can see the hard edges of the magneto tail here. And we're just gonna play this through. You're going to see some southward IMF. This is the quiet time ahead. Southward IMF is now interacting with the entire magneto tail. It's taking a while to get things organized in terms of flows, but now here it comes. And rather than there being just nice, even flows coming back <clears throat> from wherever that reconnection point is, what we're seeing is we get ton, tons of these flows. They're called bursty bulk flows. And a lot of the discussion that goes on in the research world right now is how much of what happens in the inner magnetosphere in terms of energizing particles, including the ring current, are associated with these channels or bursts of flows, and how much is associated with strong, just driving, just general flows being driven in from the reconnection region. The Van Allen probes provided some information. There is a paper written, I think, in 2015 that said, that showed both electric and magnetic field measurements that for the strong driving associated with geomagnetic storms, that you needed the strong convection electric field, and it was just sitting on top, uh, superposing with the variation in these, uh, it's associated with these flow channels. So the flow channels themselves will be characteristic of small geomagnetic storms or with substorms, but to get the, the big substorms, DST minus 100 nanotesla, you need everything happening. You need the convection fields and these channel flows. So um, now would be a, a good time to break. I'll get a glass of water. And uh, Nick, we're uh, answering a lot of questions and we're kind of behind. I'm not quite sure whether to go on with this. I'm about halfway through or to flip over to how did we get the minds to blow up? So you got, you and I can discuss that uh, sure. while everybody else gets some coffee. Okay. So be back by uh, 1035. So we're oh, getting great, great questions. Which mines? Whose mines are you blowing up? Oh, yeah, oh, those mines. Um, those mines, those sea mines. <laughs> um, certainly, yes, there, certainly there are some, uh, yes, that's, uh, uh, certainly there are some good questions. Um, let, me, let me escape here and see where I am in the grand scheme of right. things. Um, ha. Ha. I'm go uh, let me say, I, I, I feel obligated to say a little bit something more about the radiation belts. Okay. So I will do that um, because, you know, the, these enhancements of the radiation belts, uh, well, even after however many years of the Van Allen probes, they're still mysterious. So I think I ought to at least ad address that as areas of research. So I'm going to skip and get down here to slide 34, uh, maybe slide 35, with just doing some skipping, and then we'll go over into the other um, event. And I'll just uh, I'll make short work of it. They've got the paper to read, uh, mm -hmm. and we can go at it that way. How much How much time would you like to um, spend on the? impact on the impacts like the the sea mines or or other impacts that you like to let's let's give my let's give me uh let's give me 12 more minutes assuming there might be a question or two uh, so when we when we reconvene i'm going to try and get through the remainder of the must-haves in 15 minutes 
And then I think, well, whatever's left, we just say, hey, we're going to move that to office hours, and then I'll go over into the, uh, into the other one. So I mean you'll have about 25 minutes on the impasse. Yeah, that, I, we can do that. That'll work. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lots of good basic questions here, and you never, it's, it's really hard to know when, when you have a diverse group of students who haven't seen this material before or just now realizing the implications of all the things that have been talked about before, and they go, oh, but what about? Um, right. Which is fun, but you're never going to get exactly where you think you're going to get. Uh, sure. Dolores, I think you're doing a really good job balancing a, a broad view with these specific questions. And I think you read it right that the students are a fairly broad group and many of them probably not as versed in magnetospheric physics, though a couple no. are. So I would agree with the choices you are making. Make it good. broad and must have knowledge. Uh, to get through, and then maybe near the end, get to the bombing business, okay. which I saw in the movie, which is very, very interesting. The movie is quite eliminating itself, so they have had that's, chance to see That's it. true. That's true. So I could, I could, um, I know that story well enough that in the, in the subsequent 25 minutes, I could just skip to some of the things that didn't get commented on in the movie because there were some, there were other things that just weren't as flashy as, oh, we blew up 3,000 sea mines. Yes, exactly. I, I think the movie was nice. I hope to have seen it. I sat through it and it was, I didn't know about this. Mm. Uh, so I was fascinated uh, by how this came about. And certainly I haven't read it in any book, so. Richard Nixon, as you well know, he was well known to uh, have um, kind of sabotaged the uh, peace talks because of his desire to get into uh, be reelected. Oh my gosh, Amitabha, if uh, that, the, the right? things I would have liked to have put, but I'm going, okay, I'm, I'm making a commentary here on <laughs> space weather. I'm not going into that realm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So I, I had, this was good context restoring thing. It was good for me to learn that he didn't initiate it himself. No, he, he, the military, as, as I read the memoirs, worked 24-7, the Navy sea mine men worked 24-7 at feverish pace to reconstruct mines and put them back. And that's really dangerous work. You don't want to do it fast and you don't want to do it wrong. Well, you don't want to do it wrong. You may have to do it fast. <laughs> and so one of the things that really struck me was when I found on the internet, the memoir of the, of the uh, chief sea uh, mine office uh, NCO uh, and his comments uh, complaining about the fact that those people did not get recognized for what they did because this was classified at the time. I thought, yeah, I bet so. Okay. All right, if you could turn your cameras on, if you're back. Let me know when we're ready to go, Nick. Do you need to get anything? Me? Yeah. No, I'm fine. Great. If we're ready, I'll start. Uh, but the half back, I think we got Half back, yeah. If we're, so turn if you turn your cameras on, if you're back, just to let me know. If you can't turn your cameras on, put your hand up. <laughs> well, we've got some bandwidth issues that uh, uh, that so some people are struggling with a little bit. Okay. Okay, I well, think you can get started. Okay. So we're going to skip over a few things in the interest of time, but uh, I've talked with Nick about what are the kind of the must have ideas coming out of what's going on during a geomagnetic storm. So I'm showing you here, courtesy of uh, Professor Dan Baker from the Laboratory of Atmospheric and Space Physics, the timeline of the four, almost five MeV electrons. Uh, that the, that uh, the Van Allen probes measured from uh, fall of 2012 all the way out to 2017. So a five-year cycle, of, or a five-year interval, and you see these regions of 
red. So this is when the electron flux in the outer radiation belts went up and extended from 3RE out to 6RE. And out here in the gray zone, we really don't know what's going on because we didn't make the measurements. But the questions that got asked and answered is, what is it that really contributes to these events where we enhance the outer radiation electrons, the MEV electrons? Shen Lin Li also at last did a really comprehensive study and found, to no surprise, we need prolonged southward IMF, BZ, or at least intervals where it's fluctuating back and forth between BZ North and mostly BZ South. We need high solar wind speeds. We knew that already. But we need relatively low solar wind dynamic pressure. So events where we have a big chunk of plasma uh, ahead of a CME, so one of these very large shocked CMEs, can actually tip the system to go the other way. And it can actually kind of clean out the radiation belts and then they have to restart. So uh, this understanding of the solar wind dynamic pressure was uh, that this is a new result coming out of uh, Shen Lin's paper. The other thing that happens is we found out that we really need what's called intense chorus waves. And let me see if I can just get to what is an intense chorus wave. I'm gonna go forward, uh, sorry about that. If I now look at the inner magnetosphere, there is a place where as ring current ions start to drift, so these are the ones that, um, and these, these are the electrons over here, they start to drift over towards dawn. They have the ability to interact and actually create waves with which they then interact more. Those are called chorus waves. And those chorus waves can do two things. They can energize the electrons and they can knock them out of their confined magne magnetic bottle to essentially uh, fall into the atmosphere. So there is a very interesting interaction that goes on at the outset of some storms where we get the ring currents contributing to their own demise, those particles, but then kicking those particles into high energy states where they become part of the radiation belt or they fall into the atmosphere. So that is what Shen Lin found. And uh, I think I'll just pass over that. So as we're driving these particles in from the plasma sheet, getting them heated up to be part of the ring current population, if they have interactions with uh, waves and particles or particularly strong driving, some of those particles are going to end up in the ring current, some are going to get put out into the radiation belt. So you can enhance both the inner radiation, uh, the outer radiation belts and the ring current, and the outer radiation belts will probably stay enhanced for a little longer than, uh, than the ring current. Everything hinges on this solar wind electric field that's E equals a minus V cross B, adding energy into the magnetospheric particles. So the one other thing that I want to say that's a hot topic is those same strong electric fields can draw particles out of the cold ionosphere. Those particles, especially oxygen, will be drawn out and they become part of this population. It takes a lot of energy to get those cold particles to heat it up to where they can participate in the ring current, but we know that during the big storms, that's what's happened. And so if you go through this cycle of drawing out these energetic O plus from getting them up to 8RE and then redistributed out, that is when you know you have had a very strong storm. And indeed, our uh, estimates of composition indicate that the O plus uh, part of the ring current really goes up for the strongest storms. I heard an estimate once that during these big events, you'll pull 30 tons of atomic oxygen out of the atmosphere and put it into the ring current. 
And then the last thing I want to talk about before we go over to what blew up the sea mines is the ability of these convecting particles, some ring current, uh, other low energy particles, to actually come in and start to interact with the cold particles that are part of the plasma sphere to shear those off and draw them out as part of the convective system. Here you see the actual image from the image spacecraft of the plasma sphere being uh, reshaped and compressed and a tongue of that plasma being pulled out, sent to the day side where it's this cold plasma as it exits the magnetopause starts to interact with the materials that are part of the reconnecting system and it will actually reduce the efficiency of the magnetic merging as these cold particles drawn out from the plasma sphere start to interact with um, the reconnection region. And to me, that is fascinating. That is nature feeding back on itself, reining itself in. And until we had the, the um, spacecraft uh, observations of the last 20 to 30 years, we had no idea that those kinds of interactions could take place. So to me, that is fascinating. So I, uh, uh, here's where I will end this. And this is a storm from 1997. So we'll take our ba ourselves back for almost 25 years and look at the DST record. Here you should recognize the shock arrival. The decrease, suddenly there's, there's something going on in the magnetosphere that is causing a a production of the ring current that's going to oppose the, the Earth's magnetic field. So we tell you here that the IMF turned southward as a result from a CME that is coming in from the sun. It was an, a very energetic one. It created a Morton wave at the sun. As we are during, coming into this main phase, we're seeing that there are multiple substorm onsets. So in addition to the primary uh, cross-tail electric field, we're getting these channels of flows that I showed you in the movie uh, to contribute to the ring current. And now we start to see here, just as we get to DST minimum, we're starting to see the appearance of relativistic electrons. Uh, the ring current stays a strong, but I would guess here, that we probably saw either a slowing of the solar wind speed or the IMF turn northward. And that allows the system to start to recover, but it doesn't go all the way back to baseline. That means that either we had high speeds uh, solar wind, very often the case, uh, flowing right behind that CME, or we had another interval of strong southward um, interplanetary magnetic field. So if we take this as kind of a whole picture with just this DST index, we can start to see and, and think backwards and forwards about what would I expect and what likely happened. Uh, this is the stuff that research papers get made of, and it is uh, what we do to uh, kind of reconstruct the drivers and the interactions that go with um, uh, southward IMF, high speed solar wind, and are all of the populations of particles and current systems in the, um, in the magnetosphere. So on one graphic, I've, I've summed it all up, one storm in one black and white graphic. And uh, I, I, take, I, I think maybe I'll take a break here and see if any hands go up, and then, then we'll switch over to the other uh, what happened in the in the really big storm i have mesmerized them or they've gone to sleep ah i see one hand raised yes uh, yeah so uh, this is in response to our discussion what we were having in our synchronous groups so this is related to the movie that you showed about the uh, bulk flows so uh, what I found is we see uh, 
we see ripples forming that is uh, probably due to kh instability yep kelvin helmholtz right here exactly yes like what we were wondering is why is the it's, uh, i mean the ripples are not forming uh, right from the nose of the uh, bow magnetic i mean the bow region um wh why do you not get uh, the kelvin helmholtz here yeah it's starting uh, yes. at the tangential part yeah um i think that has to do with the fact that the speeds are very low here because you you've essentially stopped the flow but out here, not too far uh, off, uh, say at about the 10 o'clock region, that's when that flow is starting to speak, uh, pick up again. And that is where you get the big shear in, uh, in flow speed. So I think that's what, what will drive the Kelvin Helmholtz at that location. Okay. But anybody okay. else can chime in on that. That's just what I, what I have pulled out of the discussions from, from uh, yesterday. Right, we were discussing on similar terms, but again, thanks for the clarification. Okay, and, and Deb, the talk, I see, talk is going great. Uh -huh. Deb, did I see a question from you? Yeah, so my question is that in one of your slides, you've shown that we have a cold plasma around the earth. Uh -huh. We also have a hot uh, Van Allen belt. Yes. So how they means place at the same place actually means how <laughs> Yeah, they occur at the same place. So that's my question. So one. So those plasma is... populations. Uh, maybe I'll just stay on. Maybe I'll just stay on this since it at least gives you those plasma populations are so very tenuous, far mm -hmm. less than one particle or one particle per cubic centimeter, and uh, with very different energies, they are effectively not able to interact with each other directly but only via wave particle interactions. So it, it is amazing, but, but happens all the time and verified by measurements that you can have these hot particles just streaming through these regions occupied by a colder, denser plasma. And they're both perfectly happy to be there and ignore each other. Okay, I think since... Uh... Reynolds number is pretty high there. The viscous effects are too low. That's why they are uh, not at all interacting or something like this. I'm not sure. I'm just guessing. You might have a better sense of that than I do, Deb. I, oh, I, I, I don't yeah, know. I'll, I'll uh, chime in. Yeah. The, you know, Reynolds number really ha is, has to do with viscosity, which has to do with uh, collisions. Um, and, and these of which there aren't any. Describing uh, their particles have no collisions. Yeah. So they're just, um, yeah, they, they don't interact with each other. They can only interact by creating waves in the magnetic field that then interact with, with a different charged particle. Right, but of course the waves are kind of a collective phenomena that involve both populations at once. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, you have to have a handshake on that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, I'm going to hop over to a different presentation. You see my messy uh, screen here in a second. Uh, and we'll put that away. I think we'll put it away. And now we'll uh, I'll go searching around. Screen sharing is stopped. Thank you. I'll go searching around for my new uh, open presentation. And great storms. Okay, and I will bring that back up and let's see if I can do this. I will now share my screen again and I will look for my great storms. And uh, Nick, you have to be the timekeeper again because I will talk, I will just, I love this stuff. I will just talk. Okay, so uh, this graphic was actually created as a result of the publicity that went with the, the uh, describing the, the great sort of counter storm of August 1972. Uh, some of the Itali uh, Australian uh, um, people, um, broadcasters were so uh, 
interested in this based on the, some of the work that my Australian co-author did that they created this really cool graphic. And since I am not an artist, I have so much appreciation for this. I can actually color, but that's about as good as it gets. So this is the sun reaching out, having an interaction with our magnetosphere, which is just kind of, well, it's artistic. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, great storms and space weather. I'm just going to give you a couple of hints of some of these pre-modern storms and then try and skip into this space age storm and figure out how it was that we got into a situation where an engineered system, which in this case was actually several engineered systems, felt incredible impacts and yet because the DST index did not even reach minus 125, it was considered kind of a, eh, uh, an intense storm, but nothing to be excited about. And if you've, if you've read the papers or watched that video, you know it, it actually, the DST index failed horribly to describe this event. So I didn't say much about auroral storms in the previous discussion, but I want you to know that auroral storms is what humanity has been observing for well beyond 2,500 years. And this is a beautiful record, literally etched in clay, that describes an unusual red glow in the sky at night, 557, 567 BC, before the Common Era. And on the night of the 29th, there was a red glow that flared up in the west. Uh, in the modern calendar, this would be the 12th to 13th of March, which is a known time. There are more uh, geomagnetic storms and auroral storms in the equinoxes. And this has occurred at a latitude that to see an aurora would, the typical frequency now would be about a, a tenth of an observation per year or once per solar cycle. So this is the earliest fully datable observation of an aurora. There is one clay tablet that looks like it hints at something that is a, a few decades before this. But to me, this is gorgeous to see something etched in clay that describes a great geomagnetic, a, a large geomagnetic storm. Um, there are various, the, the first datable auroral sketch, this is 771 uh, in the common era, and here out there in the margin of this library book is an auroral arch. Now, the person who drew this is apparently the author of this book, and uh, so it was okay to be uh, sketching in the, in the uh, margins. And, and this person says it was seen at harvest time, it occupied the entire northern eastern side of the uh, sky. It formed <clears throat> as a blood red scepter, a green one, a black one, and a saffron colored one going from above and below. And as soon as one column would go away, another column would appear. And it changed shape 70 times. So this must have been an extraordinary uh, uh, auroral event again in what is now Eastern Turkey. Um, let's see, in 1204, there was a red vapor observed in southern Japan, sky at night, and um, it, it actually occurred for two nights in a row, so probably an active region that threw out at least two interplanetary coronal mass ejections. It was good viewing weather, quite windy, and then at the time that, it was, that you would light the lamps, a red vapor appeared in the north. It was like a distant mountain burning and it was very dreadful. On the previous two nights, they had actually put off a pilgrimage that they were, this person was going to make. So this is the first um, uh, indication of an actual space weather effect on humanity. Somebody changed their plans. And this scene in Southern Japan is a very big deal to see an auroral uh, red vapor. And then there are just gorgeous images that are uh, found in woodcuts uh, in, from um, uh, Northern Europe. These uh, appearances of red sky at night uh, were very frightening. 
uh, this poor, these poor folks down here, they've dropped to their knees. They're really terrified that something bad is going to happen. And it became kind of a moniker that I think may have been encouraged by those in power to say, hey, this something really bad is going to happen if, you know, if the pop if the population doesn't uh, behave. So red sky at night, famine in sight. So these people truly believe that these kinds of apparitions in the skies were, were bad omens. Um, I think I've already gone through this. I, I want to point this one out to you because it is an event that occurred in 1770. So we're just about coming into the industrial age. This is a painting. Uh, again from Japan, and these beautiful columns of red aurora. And I want to just blow this up so that you can see this artist captured these uh, probably peasants from the countryside. And I looked and I tried to understand what they were doing because they seemed to be up at night. This was as recorded at midnight. And I finally figured out that here is a person who's gone out to the stream. He he has a bucket and there are other people up here on their thatched roofs who have buckets and what they are doing is they are getting water out of the stream to throw up on their straw roofs so that the fire that appears to be coming over the distant hills when it arrives they will have their roofs wetted down and they will save their homes to me that is extraordinary okay so now I'm going to very briefly describe the uh, 1859 storm because that is what is known as the Carrington storm. I've re I'm a co-author on this um, paper. Uh, we've been looking at this and looking at uh, some of the um, so sunspot images that were actually um, created and stored in the Vatican. Uh, we can see it almost looks like a scorpion here. Hey, Dolores. Uh huh. There's an interesting uh, point came up in chat, and I don't know why I didn't think about it, but uh, uh -huh. Elo points out that you know, we, we talk about the aurora, uh, the visible aurora as green, uh -huh. um, but uh, all, the, all these imagery shows it as, show them as red. Yes. Right? My very last slide, which I can, I could skip to, but let me tell you that great red aurora or these stable auroral red arcs are the, are a mark, perhaps the mark uh, pre-industrial uh, for a great storm. It has to do with, you guessed it, the ring current. And the ring current is having such strong interactions, oh, this is you know, the knowledge that I have, is having such strong interactions with the plasma pause that energy is being extracted from the ring current. It is uh, exciting electrons uh, in the upper uh, regions of the, of the atmosphere where this heat is being dissipated. And they're kind of low energy. They're interacting with the atomic oxygen and it is atomic oxygen that glows red. So it is a very specific type of interaction that seems to develop when you have an extraordinary ring current interacting with the plasma sphere as the plasma sphere is no doubt contracting. And does that tend to be at low latitudes? Uh, yeah, it, uh, well, certainly the ring current generally maps to, low, to lower latitudes, you know, it's subauroral. But during these intervals where the IMF would be southward, the polar cap and the entire auroral zone in both hemispheres uh, expands equatorward. And so you are seeing, an ex the implication is an extraordinary deformation of the mag a geomagnetic field. Okay, great. So, Okay, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot to take in. Ah, speaking of red aurora, so this was in the 1859, this was the red aurora sketched out of Australia. I can't remember if this is Sydney, but here are these beautiful arches, here are these columns again. I've been asked many times, why does it collimate like this? And the answer is, I don't know. And I challenge any of you in this class to be the first one to, to uh, explain that. 
Could it be that it just actually didn't call me that way? Uh, we, we have seen so many pictures of great Aurora and they all have these columns. It, it's, it's amazing. I, I don't know what's going on. Wow, that's interesting. Uh huh. Well, let me see if I can, I don't think I had to take some out, so I don't think I have all the examples, but it's very common. And the fact that these Aurora are so intense that they can be seen by, you know, uh, by human eyes, really, really amazing. Most of the red Aurora that you've seen since say 1989 have been captured by some kind of longer exposure with uh, cameras. So these images are really, truly amazing. So where were these Aurora seen? Oh, just all over the place, very, very low latitudes. It was a multi-day event. It was the end of October, uh, October 30, 28th through 29th. And then again, a second CME came in about September 1st and 2nd. Uh, so auroras were seen in multiple locations, uh, multiple times, uh, again, indicating that there was a very active region and active longitude. So I am now going to skip forward to the August 1972 event. We have one very intense Delta class sunspot region right here. Uh, not quite on the 3rd of August, not quite to Central Meridian. Uh, this is calcium line, I believe, but it clearly indicates that tremendous suppression of convection here, very intense magnetic field. And even on the 31st of July, it was starting to act up. Here is the record of the multiple X-class flares. And I will tell you that these are hourly averages, so they don't really convey the level of uh, X-class flare that were being generated. And furthermore, the instruments were saturating. So multiple X-class flares during the passage of this event, which meant there were probably multiple Earth-directed CMEs, which is the key to this badly behaved storm. Um, it's one of the most intense intervals of solar and geospace activity in the space age. The active region had a large penumbra uh, with a, what's called delta configuration, meaning that there are multiple different orientations of the uh, sun's magnetic field within the, within the core. There are uh, light bridges, uh, regions in, uh, connecting these. And then on the 2nd of August, there was the first X-class flare and a recorded white light flare. So now we know that it's really active. On the 4th of August, we have um, done some reverse engineering and the X, what the flare that was called X-5, we're now pretty sure was an X-20. It also included gamma rays, the first space-based observations of gamma rays. And then the same active region goes again, X-class flare and white light flare on the 7th of August. We believe there was probably a white light flare for this one as well. It's just that the primary observatories that would have seen it were at dusk and dawn and may not have had a good view. Um, it was considered a three brilliant H alpha. It was a long duration flare. As a matter of fact, the flare or perhaps the second flare that could not be distinguished with, from the first one was still ongoing when the, the shock of the CME arrived. Uh, so now we know that was bad. We had uh, X-ray observatory up on the orbiting solar observatory five and the X-rays that were being recorded from this region were pretty impressive. So what happened? Uh, just as soon as those flares went off on the 4th of August, the radio propagation disturbance blackout uh, <clears throat> hit the day side. Uh, then the polar cap regions as the solar energetic particles started to arrive within 20 minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, the night side became so disturbed as the CMEs was passing. Excuse me. that the night side ionosphere actually started to take on the characteristics of the day side, of a day side system. There was a very rapid rise in solar energetic particles. That's what these curves are right here. 
spacecraft solar panels began to immediately deteriorate and some of the particles were completely, the sensors were completely overwhelmed. There was so much energy coming in to such low altitudes that there was a long lasting ozone depletion, which it became the stuff of a number of research articles. And um, in the meantime, the, the space weather uh, observers started to notice that the galactic cosmic rays seemed to be dropping out, which is an indication that something very large has um, occurred. And you're probably hearing the banging now with my roof coming off. Uh, so there was something very large, a magnetic structure between the sun and the earth that was actually blocking the cosmic rays. There was a sudden storm commencement at about 21 uh, UT and an extraordinary sudden impulse. It is this sudden impulse that we believe triggered the sea mines. That was associated with a tremendous solar wind and density enhancement uh, that was to some degree pre-existing from a previous CME. It probably preconditioned geospace to be um, uh, very dense with plasma that would not normally be there. It would be associated perhaps with the uh, uh, reconnection going on, not so much at the day side, but also in at the high latitude cusp because we're pretty sure the interplanetary magnetic field was northward for some of the hours exceeding this. So we think we had a very unusual state of the um, magnetosphere with a lot of cold particles, which may have made it difficult to actually gen up the ring current. That may be part of the issue for the, for the dubious behavior of the DST index. We know that there had been numerous path clearing events so that the CME that was generated at about 6 UT on the morning of the, of the of 4th of August, uh, actually got here, arrived, at least the shock ahead of it, got here in 14.6 hours with an average speed of just under 3,000 kilometers per second. We think that was shock and sheath structures and even structures within the sheath of the arriving CME. This is reconstructed uh, from both um, Eastern and Western Bloc countries that finally got together in 76, 1978 to put all the data together. You're getting hourly averages here. We think that some of the measurements were probably just saturated, but we know that the velocity was huge and the solar wind densities ahead of that time were probably on the order of 50 to 60. So we have a magnetosphere that if it had entrained any of that cold solar wind plasma, was probably in a very strange state. Hey, I'll Dolores, skip. a couple yep. of questions piling up in, in chat. So one, uh, one is about the CMEs and the, the block and G, GCRs. Like this, this graphic right here. Oh, great, okay. And then the <laughs> other question was about white light uh, uh, flares and, um, and what causes the white light, but you may want to save that till the end if you want. I'll save the white light part till the end, but I, since I've got this Forbish decrease up, what we, what we think is happening is the sun was, was chunking out CME after CME. And uh, this last one, because space had been evacuated to so, a large degree by the previous CME, this CME had probably really ballooned out. There was no interplanetary pressure or very little pl interplanetary pressure to confine it. And so you essentially have this huge magnetic structure ahead of Earth and maybe one beyond Earth. And both of those are acting as scatterers for the galactic cosmic rays and just sending them back out to space rather than arriving at Earth's atmosphere. Uh, this is the strangest Four bush, it's called four bush decrease when these things happen. And the, the reduction in cosmic ray intensity arriving at Earth was seen at all of the uh, observatories. So we know it was a global event. So I, uh, I hope that's helpful. I can chat about that more in office hours afterwards, if, if that's okay. And I'll, I'll save white light flare for, for the end. Okay, uh, 
these, this uh, cartoon here, this structure right here, had uh, no doubt when it lifted off, there was a solar energetic particles that were uh, perhaps already there was a seed particle population and this fast moving structure was then shock, was, uh, shock acceleration was increasing the energy of these uh, uh, already present solar energetic particles. This event is one of the most intense flux of what is called low to moderate solar energetic particles in the space age. I think it has uh, the highest still on record 30 MeV uh, energetic ions. Those, by the way, are sufficient to penetrate a space suit of an astronaut out on a spacewalk. We, we were very lucky and that we were just in between Apollo shots during that time. These particles were also interacting with solar panels. Spacecraft were losing their power generation capability at the rate of 5% a day, and one DOD spacecraft mission was lost within 90. Polar HF communications disappeared because the ionosphere and the poles was being put into a bizarre state. And as I mentioned, the ionospheric E region on the night side was behaving as if it were a day side um, E region. So just the strangest state in the world. I want to point out to you that this sharp rise right here indicates the arrival of a CME. So this is when particles right at the leading edge of that CME shock structure are arriving. So there were probably a couple of events during this time. But so the cosmic rays, the galactic cosmic rays are being excluded and particles from the sun are being energized. And so we have this bizarre mix of energetic particles. Now to why the sea mines blew up. So we have one spacecraft out at geosynchronous orbit, ATS-5. It's in the magneto sheath, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, it's no longer in the magneto sheath, it's in the solar wind. And so what has happened is we believe here, the spacecraft was in the magneto sheath measuring typical magneto sheath um, magnetic fields, and then, the field goes southward, which uh, it should not do unless it is actually measuring solar wind magnetic fields. So all of a sudden it goes southward. Now this would be a compressed field by about a factor of four. So the IMF field was probably about fi minus 50 nanotesla for a number of hours. This is the first storm sudden commencement, the first shock. Then the field goes northward again and then it oscillates wildly. And we, I believe, based on the very limited information that I have, that is at this time frame right here, that there were so much magnetic perturbation throughout the entire magnetosphere linked to field aligned currents that propagated very rapidly to at, at essentially light speed for uh, for these um, for these magnetic uh, near light speed for these magnetic perturbations that this is the instant in which um, the magnetic signal was large enough at near equatorial regions to actually detonate uh, 3,000 sea mines in, in one go. There wasn't an, an aircraft up and operating that saw several of the sea mines blow. Uh, it was a Navy um, mine checker. Uh, they didn't see all 3,000 of them go, but they did subsequent uh, kind of visual checks and just found that there were all kinds of what they call mud pots, indicating that various other sea mines that they had not seen had blown. Just at about that same time, there were huge voltage swings in the northern tier of the United States. The biggest uh, rate of change of magnetic field at the surface of the Earth was at Mianook, which is in north central Canada, probably a place where you don't have a lot of uh, high voltage magnetic field lines. But in fact, the magnet, those magnetic perturbations were on the order of 2000 nanotesla per minute. Even as far south as kind of the central US, we were seeing 800 nanoteslas per minute. That was large enough to induce an electric field of seven volts per kilometer, which exceeded the thresh, uh, shutdown threshold capability, cap, a threshold for 
uh, the cable that the AT&T operated that carried uh, long distance information across the central United States. So that got shut down and a huge investigation in, ensued to figure out, well, what are we gonna do about that? What, what do we really have to have in order to keep communication lines up? GICs, geomagnetically induced currents, uh, activated protective relays. There's actually some discussion about some of the carbon blocks turning even more carbon uh, during this time. Uh, that was, uh, I think, in the Newfoundland uh, area. There were shadow casting aurora in southern UK, but it never went further south than that, or further equatorward, as we can tell. That's an indication that likely a large part of this geomagnetic storm occurred under northward IMF. Uh, there, uh, Janet Kuzira uh, has done a lot of work on that, and she says the equatorward extent of even the red aurora should be confined to about 55 uh, north or south, and that appears to be the case. But the aurora that were there were shadow casting bright. And here I will just show you the time frame from this solar wind uh, variation. So about three hours of time here. And here is the ground magnetic signature from um, the Philippines, which is the closest that I can measurement that I can get to the no, uh, coast of, uh, of, of Vietnam. And here is this kind of interesting, uh, very rapid decrease and then this sharp increase. We believe that it is this sharp increase and then oscillations thereafter that, that essentially uh, triggered the mines. And it may not have been a single one. You can see these oscillations going. This is 168 nanoteslas per minute. Um, these mines had been set up so that they would detect a large ship coming by and the magnetic signature that might go with that. I can only guess that it was somewhere around 100 to 150 nanotesla per minute, a value that no one thought would ever be exceeded. Well, it was. And so the mines started blowing. And so uh, this is an image not of that time, but at shortly thereafter, when uh, the US and, and the Vietnam had finally agreed that they uh, would uh, come up with some kind of a semi peace agreement. And part of what the US agreed to do was sweep all of the mines that had been laid in the, in the river channels and in the ocean out and in the harbors. And so this is a, a, uh, a, a sled being towed by a helicopter and it's going by, it's creating a signature that's a big enough DBDT that will cause the sea mine to explode. So this is human sweeping of the sea mine fields. But what happened on the 4th of August was the premature detonation of over 4,000 magnetically sensitive destructor mines. Um, and the uh, parent, we don't know exactly what time that was. But I don't know if anybody knows or if it's still classified. But uh, uh, Michael Gonzalez was a C, uh, uh, was a Navy man in charge of essentially putting those mines back in place. And he said they worked 24 seven in Manila under grueling conditions to essentially reconstruct the uh, minefield so that the pressure would stay on and the materials flowing into North Vietnam would not be able to flow uh, so that we could all agree on a peace accord. And that is my story. And I will uh, now be happy to just, I'll stop here. There's other things I can bring up, but uh, there may be chats going on, questions, and maybe I need to ask and answer the question about the white light flare. All right, uh, please thank Dolores for a, uh, an enlightening and, and, and Historic, historic talk. Great. Um, so we can uh, uh, certainly answer the question about the white light flare and then take any other questions that we have. Okay. So uh, one of the questions uh, I've, I've often, often been asked is, why would you see a flare in 
quite light. We know that we typically see flares, uh, we see what's called H-alpha flares. Uh, so we, we see the uh, particles actually, uh, we see the, the hydrogen atoms of which the sun is uh, uh, primarily comprised uh, essentially in uh, an excited state. But what happens is uh, during the, um, uh, particles, when the particles are coming down the field lines uh, as the, the flare loops are um, being created, there is so much interaction from the particles energized at the reconnection site in that kind of long skinny leg of the, um, uh, the uh, magnetic reconfiguration that those are coming down and so strongly heating the um, uh, plasma in the photosphere and the, um, uh, I guess, the lower chromosphere uh, that you actually get, and Dana, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, you actually get kind of a population inversion and you start okay. getting... It's um, uh, pretty complicated. Actually, I will say, uh, understanding white light flares is is pretty much beyond <laughs> most people in the field. Okay. Uh, they're very very puzzled by it. Uh, most most models predict the energy the electrons will not reach anywhere near that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the favorite ideas is that they so heat the uh, the chromosphere yep. that they create a back warming, which is essentially yes radiation coming down from the chromosphere, which is where the energetic particles have to stop. And then radiation goes down to a lower level, like the temperature minimum. And that will, uh, well, one of, the, one of the other theories is that what that does is uh, ionizes enough, turns out silicon is the thing you wanna ionize, and you ionize really? enough silicon to move the layer of continuum upward. Oh. This is one, one of the many theories for why there are white light flares, but we're to the at the moment, uh, I would say even the people who really study these things, and, and there are a lot of them, or you know, comparatively, a lot have uh big debates about what, what actually creates a white light flare. Um, what was fun to me in doing the research, and I, I, I actually did spend time in the dust, dusty high altitude observatory archives <laughs> looking material on this and there was a scientist who wrote an article on though even though we didn't observe the white light flare that went with this how big would it have needed to be oh yeah <laughs> right right i mean there, there's been a wonderful study um i can't remember the author's name um they basically used superposed epic analysis uh, to go back and show, you know, not back, not like historically back, but show that, that there are a lot of flares that we don't consider white light flares that do have white light signatures. But mm -hmm. the, the, the decrease in emission is so small, or increase uh -huh. in emission is so small, that it's really, really hard to see. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a mysterious uh, event. So is the, light, is the white light part of a continuum? It is in the continuum, yes. So it's broad, it's broadband. So it, it, it'll it extend into UV and maybe even IR? Boy, I... <laughs> okay. Depending uh, I on who you talk to and what paper you read. Okay. <laughs> you know, I might be able to, to kind of put the, a bow on this presentation by just showing this... Uh, this um, diagram that Bill Denig, who used to be at the uh, National Center for Environmental Research, he's retired, uh, he put together the, the parts in blue, and I have studied two storms that are the ones in, in yellow that never showed up on a radar because, well, don't know why they didn't show up on a radar. The, thir the This top storm had a DST index of minus 386, so it was certainly a beauty. It behaved exactly as we thought, except that it put out extraordinary radio emissions that wreaked all kind of havoc in uh, uh, World War, uh, Cold War radar detectors. But the amazing thing about this event is that DST got down to only minus 125, which we've already figured out is an intense storm. But on every other scale, 
it it probably it hit the approximately a uh, NOAA radiation f uh, storm five scale. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a radio storm five scale. So that would have been the X rays at X20. Uh, the radiation scale was approximately S5. I don't think they've ever really had a, a radiation storm at S5. But this is the closest that they've gotten. And then uh, the, the G scale really, uh, so that's just the general KP driven scale, only went to four, but that's a little bit of a false piece of information because the, uh, the KP was changing across a day boundary and so i don't know that it actually uh got recorded as being a kp5 or kp9 storm when in fact it actually it, i guess it was eight zero so for something that was occurring while the imf was northward and the dst was only minus 125 we had solar space weather impacts that that are breathtaking and very worrisome to uh you know those people who do planning and i have put in my commentary that i truly believe that this was a carrington class storm but it came in with the north with geomagnetic field north rather than south and so that is why it is such an odd storm. Had this been a southward field storm, and it was for very short amounts of time, but if this had been a southward field storm, this probably would have been a Carrington storm plus. So that is my story, and I will stick through that story, at least through office hours. <laughs> Other questions for Dolores? Oh, there's no student question at the moment. I, I'll just ask, you showed a, uh, some evidence for a geomagnetic storm or for some aurora in 770. Yeah. AD. yeah. Uh, do, do you know anything about whether that could possibly be related to what they see as a uh, big flare they think happened in about 770, I've forgotten. Um, uh, I think that may be why the first author, who's Hisashi Hayakawa, he's, he's just earned his PhD, why he actually started digging around to look at that event. Okay. Uh, he is a, a person who, uh, Hisashi speaks probably seven languages <laughs> and just roams the world uh, digging into literature to find this kind of thing. He's uh, uh, extraordinary. Okay. But I, yeah. The, the flare evidence is actually from isotopes. Yes. There, yeah. uh, I think there's a, uh, I'm, I'm part of a new EC team that I think is going to be looking at some of this. Oh, okay. Excellent. Yeah. Great fun. I, I don't know much about isotope. Well, I can spell isotope. <laughs> it's not what I normally do, but then I don't normally do what I normally do. <laughs> Dolores, can you uh, what 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 was the image from uh, that you got from one of the lab groups that you uh, that you was were particularly tickled by? Well, let's see. Um, was that something I showed? Oh, yeah. oh, oh! Show, yeah. Yeah, no, okay. Thank you. I will put this away. I'm going away, and now I'm going to uh, go back and find that. So, file open recent geomagnetic storms part one. Okay, that's opening up. Uh, close that, and now I'll go back to sharing again. Uh, share screen. And uh, here I am. This just takes a little while to share and get all lined up, as you know. And so, the reason I like what those labs group, the labs group, uh, let's see, they're getting lab group three and lab group five. Let me see if I can just get this all put in here together. Um, the reason I liked this event is because, uh, or this graphic is because um, it shows 
what the magnetic field probably looks like under mostly northward IMF, which is what we think happened in the lead up to the 1972 event. We think there was tremendous amount of solar wind density, perhaps from a solar wind filament that had hit Earth. And so Janet Kazira and I have been uh, talking about the fact that these reconnection locations right here are, don't produce <clears throat> very much in the way of geomagnetic activity, but they do allow for uh, uh, solar wind plasma to slowly infiltrate into this closed magnetosphere, which becomes cold and dense, and a very thick, cold, dense, plasma sheet is one of the um, precursors that if you have a very strong geomagnetic storm, you've got all of this material to work with in terms of particles that can be energized, but they may not go directly into the ring current. They may be doing all kinds of other things. We have not thought of IMF northward as being worthy of, of the same storm time uh, uh, kind of investigations. And so when lab group three showed me this and lab group five then showed me this closed magnetic field line, I go, oh, maybe this is what the system looked like as we went into the beginning stages of that August 72 event. Because we do know that the density was very high and we can see that the IMF had been northward. And so we may have preconditioned the magnetic, the geomagnetic field to be in a completely unusual state and then absolutely hit it with a hammer. And that was what intrigued me. So groups three and five get their byline on, on my presentation. All right, excellent. Any last questions for uh, for Dolores, or about geomagnetic storms, or about magne magnetospheres? Going once. Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Hi, Krishna. Yeah, hi. So uh, you have mentioned that uh, some of the uh, ions like uh, O plus is being uh, heated and uh, moved to the ra uh, radiation belt. So, uh, how long do they survive in the radiation belt? Or uh, actually, I think out of that, uh, I don't think they make it to the radiation belt. They make it to the ring current, but they can last for hours to days in the ring current. So the radiation belts, uh, at least the outer radiation belts, are primarily dominated by uh, the electrons. So any any donor is is fair game for the electrons. It just doesn't matter if it's a hydrogen uh, or an oxygen, or just you know some associated disassociated electron. It makes we believe uh, perhaps a little bit more difference for interactions that are going on with the ring current right at the plasma sphere. We think that there's the possibility that some of those particles are being excited and put into the inner radiation belt, which I didn't really talk about very much. But again, we think that those are primarily hydrogen. Uh, the oxygen ions are a little bit too massive to be uh, kicked up to uh, uh, energy levels where they can be effectively trapped in the inner radiation belt. Hi, Rhonda. I see you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, yes. I was just thinking about this August 1972 storm, which uh -huh. is very interesting to me. Uh, so I have a um, few qu uh, two questions. Uh, uh -huh. You mentioned that um, it was a northward storm. In a case that was a southward storm, 
would we have a much higher uh, intensity of the storm effect? Yeah. Uh, and the second, I think this would have been a Carrington storm if the field had come in southward. That that's the paper that I that I basically wrote. I'm I'm still fighting with various people, not fighting, but discussing with various people in the field whether or not this is a Carrington class storm. And I keep getting a lot of flack because the DST index did not go to yeah. the proposed Carrington level. And I'm going, well, wouldn't that be the case of us using an index to define a storm level that is completely inconsistent <laughs> with the effects observed? But, you know, discussions over a beer. <laughs> I understand. And you also showed that, for example, K uh, P index was higher. So yeah. it reached like eight. So it could uh, capture the intensity of the storm more than DSD index. And what is difference uh, that K P was so uh, higher? So the the K P index is kind of a a global index that measures the degree of disturbance of the field-aligned currents. So, ah, finally, the reason to talk about the field-aligned currents. Here they are, coming up. Um, so, various current systems in the magnetosphere uh, contribute to disturbances at subauroral latitudes, which is where the magnetometers are that are used for the KP index. So when these field aligned currents, which of course have to close on various surfaces, are greatly enhanced, then you will get, uh, as the aurora um, travel equatorward, you're also going to see the magnetic disturbances that go <clears throat> with that equatorward motion of the aurora. And so you will uh, probably if all of these current systems are being uh, enhanced, but for some reason the DS, the ring current is, is been maybe either not enhanced or disrupted in some way, these other more general ring, uh, current systems are still going to tell you the story that something very significant went on. And so the DST index can fail. We've seen it here as a storm time index or an extreme storm time index. What is interesting to me is trying to go back into the literature and find out, well, just how often does that, does that happen? So much of the research that is going on for extreme storms is relying on the DST index as being both sufficient and reliable as a measure of extreme storms. And I argue that that's not the best way to do that investigation. We need to go back and look for situations where the KP or you know, some other measures are indicating something very large happened, but maybe the DST just could not pick it up because it was some way the, the ring current was being disrupted. But until we can do the modeling, and, and I actually have uh, folks who run the space weather modeling framework working on this event, uh, you know, in their spare time, nights and weekends, uh, we're, we're still trying to figure out how the ring current could have been so disrupted. We just don't know. Okay, thank you. I also gonna, thought that DSD gonna, index is more reliable, but I see now that uh, we need to take with ca ca caution. With caution, caution. Oh, yep. yeah, home indices. Okay, thanks. I'm going to recommend that we um, we move into the office hours uh, uh, portion. If you um, uh, have questions, hang around for office hours. If not, um, we're done for today, and we do not have any assignments for tonight or anything. For Free night. Um, <laughs>